Hello and welcome to our program today. I want to thank you for joining us from wherever you are in the world and wish you all yours and everybody in your orbit a happy and healthy 2022. My name is Stacey Ingber. I'm the Associate Director here at the USC Center on Public Diplomacy and I know many of you in the audience and I'm glad that we can share some time together. I am pleased and honored to have you join us today uh, to hear what uh, Phil Sieb uh, has to say in his newest book. Many of you know Phil from either being one of his students uh, here at Annenberg or before Annenberg, um, a colleague in the field, or a consumer, I'm so sorry, a consumer of one of his many books. Either way, we're happy to have him here to join us. Moderating today's program is Dr. Patricia Riley. She was a um, faculty fellow for the center, a colleague of Phil's here at Annenberg, a mentor, a scholar, and a wise sage in the communication field. I will make sure to post both Phil's and Patty's bios in the chat so you can get a um, longer uh, a bit of information about their work. And I also want to let you know that CPD is pleased to offer in-person training again coming up this March here at beautiful uh, Annenberg in Los Angeles. Fingers crossed that all that goes well. Um, that would be three days here, March 16 to 18. So without any delay, I'd like to bring on Patty Riley to kick off today's conversation to talk with Phil Sieb about his newest book, Information at War, Journalism, disinformation and modern warfare. Patty, the floor is yours. Welcome everybody. Sorry about the phone, it never rings. And um, let's have a great program. All there right. you are, welcome Patty. Yay. Yes, uh, webinars uh, are, are always fun. Yeah, each one's a little bit different and challenging in its own way, but I'm thrilled to be here. If we were in person, this would be a standing room only audience. And so um, I'm super excited uh, to be able to moderate this session with Phil. Um, Phil is going to give us um, an intro on the book, uh, and he'll be speaking for about 20 to 25 minutes about the book. So I don't want to be repetitive, but I do want to say two quick things about the book. The first is, unlike a lot of academic books, this one's a page turner. And so there are many areas uh, in the book that are fascinating where you, know, you don't want to put it down. And so um, I can highly recommend it. And unlike Stephen Colbert, uh, who often jokes about only reading the uh, first chapter and the last chapter of the books that he talks about on his show, I actually read the whole thing. And um, I have questions if we run out of questions. So uh, without further ado, um, my wonderful friend, Phil Sieb, who's undergraduate work from Princeton, and then he went on to get a law degree. And then he started writing book after book. And I I think I've read most of them, but I do think this one's my favorite. And so, um, Phil, tell us um, how you got uh, to the point of uh, writing this particular book and what you think um, will be most valuable to the reader. Okay, thank you, Patty, and thank you, Stacy, for uh, for setting this up today, and thank all of you for attending. I'm sure I have many of my favorite former students out there, and and uh, other people that I've worked with at the State Department and elsewhere uh, over the years. Um, a little bit of background, as Patty suggested, on, on why I wrote this book. I've written quite a few books about media and foreign affairs, especially news coverage of war and terrorism. Uh, in those books, the dissemination and effects of information are 
are seen as important but background influence in armed conflict. Today, with information as plentiful and accessible at unprecedented levels, it is becoming a more significant factor in warfare itself. Now, in the context of warfare, why is this important? Um, one reason is, particularly for democracies, there is a vulnerability. Uh, public opinion matters, and so public opinion and public opinion is usually somewhat pliable. So there are will, will be contests for public opinion, and information is the way to pursue those contests. Uh, one of the examples that I cite in the book is the situation in the United States in 1940 when Britain was under siege from Nazi Germany and the U.S. was resolutely clinging to its uh, isolationism. Um, you had different players involved in this who all recognized the power of information. The British set up a news agency, a so-called news agency in New York City and disseminated pro-British stories under the guise of being a news organization. And those stories got picked up in newspapers around the United States. For an American voice, the British in London cultivated CBS journalist Edward R. Murrow. Now, Murrow is famous for broadcasting live from the rooftops of London during German bombing raids. He was the only reporter allowed to do that. In fact, the British military had turned down his request to broadcast live, but Winston Churchill himself intervened, overruled his military, and said, let Murrow do it. And Murrow was the only journalist who was allowed to broadcast live during the Blitz. And the reason was that Churchill wanted an American voice to deliver information to the American public. He knew that was important if the American public was ever going to relax its hold on its isolationist tendencies. And while this is going on, the Germans are also sending information into the United States in English language. And their goal was not to get the United States to support Germany. That they knew was not going to happen. Their goal was to, for the United States to stay neutral, to stay out of the war. So what you have there is a, is a sort of a, a crash, an auto crash of three major powers all relying on information to achieve an extremely important strategic goal. And that is not an isolated case. Uh, in, in my book, I go back even as far as the Trojan War to talk about how information has always been, a, been an important part of warfare. Now, when you think about the 20th century, consider just how information availability expanded. At the start of the 20th century, just after the Spanish-American War, the reliance is almost exclusively on print. And then in the 1920s, we have radio begin to rise. And then in the 1950s, we have television come on the scene. And then later in the 20th century, we have satellite and global television, and then the beginnings of internet media. So th just think of all those different media that have, have arisen within the period of one century, and, uh, and you get a sense of how crowded the information universe has, has, has become. We have kind of a population explosion uh, of, of information providers, so many providers and so easily accessed. Um, so what do we do with all of this? How do we determine the importance and accuracy of information? Well, one of the ways we used to do it, back when I was growing up, we had people like Walter Cronkite, who would be a gatekeeper. You didn't get your information on CBS News, which was widely, widely watched, and was one of only real th really three alternatives for national news on television, CBS, NBC, and a little bit later, ABC. Uh, and so Cronkite was the gatekeeper. And when he told us at the end of each broadcast, and that's the way it is, we tended to believe him. And his information was centrist. Whatever Walter Cronkite's personal views were, 
if you watch the CBS Evening News or if you watch the Evening News on NBC or ABC, there was kind of a gravitational pull to the center. Now, you weren't forced to agree with everything that was there. You could go off on your own, but you didn't have this highly partisan flow of information. So that's one of the big changes, um, the demise of the gatekeeper. And the person who, vote, who recognized how important that was and used the demise of the gatekeeper to his great advantage was, of course, Donald Trump. Uh, Trump knew that Twitter was basically an end run around the gatekeepers. Why should he rely on CBS or the New York Times to parse his words and, and make their comments about what he's saying when he could go directly to the public on Twitter? So there is another big change in the role of information. Everyone can have a voice, basically. Any one of us sitting with a computer in front of us, as we all are, I suspect, uh, you can be interesting or you can be outrageous. You can be accurate or inaccurate, but you will find an audience. that Maybe it'll just be the people who agree with you. Maybe it will be people who want to argue with you, but you can get that information out there. It's not that difficult. Now, for the information consumers, you have the task of sorting through not just what you want, but what you can believe, how it will motivate you to act. Henry Kissinger, about 20 years ago, made an interesting observation about information. He said there is a gap between information and knowledge, and there is a gap between knowledge and wisdom. In those gaps is where dangers lurk. Now, this is not an esoteric issue. Um, it really directs is directly related to national security. Suppose a government wants to significantly, da significantly damage an adversary nation without engaging in traditional warfare, meaning bombs and bullets. Your goal is not necessarily to seize territory, but to destabilize the adversary's political system, making that nation less of a competitive threat to you or a softening up before kinetic warfare. The most visible practitioner today is Russia. And I spend a good bit of time in the book talking about how Russia has used information. Um, and it's interesting that just a few days ago, last Thursday, uh, looking at what was going on in Ukraine, the State Department, US State Department, put out a whole series of documents, fact sheets and so on, about Russian disinformation and how their goal was to destabilize Ukraine uh, either before a military invasion or just to wreak havoc within the Ukrainian political system. Um, you might argue that that's too little too late from the State Department, but it's, a, it's an interesting effort by state and all those documents are available on the Department of State website. One of the major figures in Russia in terms of determining the use of information is a general named Valery Gerasimov, who is the chief of the general staff of the Russian armed forces. And he wrote an article in 2013. Uh, let me quote a little bit from it. He said, the very rules of war have changed. The role of non-military means of achieving political and strategic goals has grown. And in many cases, they have exceeded the power of force of weapons in their effectiveness. These non-military means, he added, should be applied in coordination with the protest potential of the population. Now that's a really interesting little phrase there, the protest potential, because you can see that that is what the Russians are aiming at now in Ukraine. They're trying to stir up this protest potential from the ethnic Russian, Russian-speaking population in the east of the country. And also, if they can, to disturb the, the rest of the population into being concerned about security and economics and things like that. Um, he said that, the, that in his article that that protest potential could be heightened through the use of informational measures. He also said that the information space opens wide asymmetrical possibilities for reducing the fighting potential of the enemy. And 
you know, when you're when you can hack into information and then broadcast based on those hacks, uh, you can really undermine public sentiment. Uh, when you look at how how countries have managed information during in wartime in the past, there are ways to get around that now. It's easier to do that, and so the Russians are very conscious of this. Um, the disinformation, as I said, is used to stir up the Russian minority in Ukraine. And there was another Russian, there is another Russian general who has also written about this. Uh, his name is Andrei Kartopolov. And he wrote in 2015 that, quote, a classical war of the 20th century consisted usually of 80% violence and 20% propaganda. New type wars consist of 80 to 90% propaganda and 10 to 20% violence. So the Russians have this strategy. They have this military philosophy that they want to work with. How do they go about doing it? Well, they set up something that is run, funded by and run one of Vladimir Putin's close friends called the Internet Research Agency, which is based in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, and I'll refer to it as the IRA. Uh, they use what they call active measures um, with information. And let me give you an example of one of the things they did to target the United States. This was in 2014. On, within a short period of time online, if you were on Facebook or Twitter or other, other venues, um, there was a report about a chemical plant explosion in Louisiana. Then there was a report about an Ebola outbreak in Atlanta. And there was one more report that claimed that an unarmed black woman had been shot by police, also in Atlanta. The online content was polished using logos from CNN and other news outlets. The report about the chemical plant explosion included eyewitness accounts. The Ebola story featured video of medical workers in hazmat suits. The Atlanta shooting story offered fuzzy video of the incident. All this was enough to cause brief panic and force first responder agencies to investigate and comment. Well, that sounds like a pretty hideous series of, of events, but none of them happened. They were all invented by the Internet Research Agency. It was kind of a test run to see how much trouble they could cause. And as it turned out, nobody was hurt. Nobody, there was no chemical explosion. Nobody was shot. There was no Ebola. But you see, you saw then how easy it was to disrupt the general social process. And that is, uh, that is something that is, is a powerful weapon, really, in and of itself. Um, David Sanger of the New York Times wrote about the creation of the IRA, that it marked a moment of profound transition in how the internet could be put to use. <coughs> Excuse me. For a decade, it was regarded as a great force for democracy, as people of different cultures communicated. The best ideas would rise to the top, and autocrats would be undercut. The IRA was based on the opposite thought. Social media could just as easily incite disagreements, fray social bonds, and drive people apart. And this was very much the case during the 2016 U.S. presidential campaign. Uh, at that time, Facebook identified 470 accounts that were controlled by the IRA and accounted for 80,000 posts between January 2015 and August 2017, perhaps reaching as many as 126 million persons. Twitter found that it had more than th almost 4,000 IRA-controlled Twitter accounts that might have reached more than a million people. And if you want to get into all the, the nitty-gritty about all this, I suggest you take a look at the Mueller report and read some of the indictments that are included in that report. A number of Russian citizens were indicted for trying to upset the political process in the United States. And you see this pattern continuing over the past year or two with COVID disinformation that is coming from, from Russia as well as from other sources. But the idea there is, again, you put out all this disinformation about COVID and people don't know what to believe. Should they believe their government or what they found on the Internet? And 
you would hope that people would have enough sense to get a, to check in with different sources of information, but they don't always do that, especially when they're scared about something like a pandemic. And so the disruptive capabilities of information are really very substantial. Um, even a bigger player in this field is China. And I saved the China discussion for the final chapter of the book because it is, it is so much more sophisticated than what anyone else is doing, including the Russians. And of course, China is, the, is always the giant in the room and, and you have to be prepared to deal with China. Um, there is a, a Department of Defense analysis of what China has been up to. Um, psychologically, well, they, the Chinese use something called three warfares. And uh, three warfares is psychological, public opinion, and legal forms of warfare. Um, what two analysts at the Department of Defense, the US Department of Defense said, that they've concluded that, inf the Chinese have concluded that informationalized war is a new type of war dominated by informationized forces that can prevail in local wars and against, quote, an opponent such as the United States that is stronger in most other aspects, such as conventional warfare. Um, the, the three warfares, the psychological warfare uses propaganda, deception, threats, and coercion to threat to affect the adversary's decision-making capability Public opinion warfare disseminates information for public consumption and guide and influence public opinion. Legal warfare uses international and domestic laws to gain international support. Um, an example of this as uh, could be seen in, in China's efforts to secure control over some contested islands in the Pacific. Uh, they use psychological warfare by having their own military presence get closer and closer. They have public opinion warfare by putting out information, making their argument that these islands really belong to them and everybody will be better off if the Chinese can control them. And then they have a legal structure where they go in and make their case in an appropriate international forum, but they take up so much time doing that that by the time the legal process gets done, the Chinese have already done what they want to do. Uh, China also has a global television network that used to be called CCTV. Now it's called CGTN, China Global Television Network, which broadcasts in six languages, plus it has a radio network. China also buys advertising and buys media properties worldwide. I'll get back to that in a second. They try to control Chinese diasporic media, which are everywhere. They're in Los Angeles, certainly. And they also have their own social media empire, something called WeChat, has 1 billion users and 100 million of whom are outside China. When I talk about buying media properties, there's an interesting case in Australia where there was a Chinese operated newspaper um, in, I believe, in both Chinese and in both Mandarin and uh, English. And it was quite anti Beijing. And so some Chinese buyers came in and bought the paper, made a nice offer for it, and bought the paper. And those people are very pro Beijing. That's the sort of thing that you see as part of this overall information strategy being used by China. And the goal for China and for anybody else, whether it's the, the Russians or the Americans or, or any other country, is to control the narrative, both locally, regionally, and globally. So how do you respond? Well, there are different ways to do it. Going back to the Internet Research Agency, in November of 2018, at the time of the U.S. congressional elections, the U.S. Cyber Command attacked the Internet Research Agency in Russia. It launched an electronic attack and knocked the IRA off the Internet for three days. The concern was that while the vote counting was going on for the congressional elections, the Internet Research Agency might try to meddle. Um, it was a very balanced retaliation. Nobody got hurt physically, and it was not an escalation. And what did the Russian government do in response? Nothing. 
they didn't want to escalate either. You can see that th th this is the sort of thing that could could easily get out of hand. So the big question now that we face is when does information use reach the level of an act of war? And nobody's quite certain about that, particularly if there's no physical harm. Now, NATO has already made it clear that if there is an information or cyber attack that causes physical harm to a NATO member, to citizens of a NATO member, Article 5, which calls for an all for one response, would come into play. But just wreaking havoc with a political system, that's that's unclear. How far can you go in undermining a political process in a country without that becoming an act of war? So that that is one area of response that's being considered. But another and perhaps more reasonable and less certainly less dangerous area of response is something called media literacy. Well, we should all be familiar with media literacy. That means we don't say things like, well, if it's on the internet, it must be true. If it's on the internet, I better check it out. And that needs to be taught to people to, to be, be to learn the skills of corroboration and of being skeptical with about information. And the country that's doing this best is not the United States, it's Finland. Finland has incorporated media literacy into its education system. In fact, one official in the Finnish government said, our first line of defense is the kindergarten classroom. And all the way from kindergarten through grade 12, there are information media literacy courses integrated within the curriculum. Uh, and there also, there's such classes are available to adults at no charge in the community if they want to partake as well. Now, Finland, of course, has had a had a rocky relationship with Russia. Uh, they're, they're, they border Russia. They fought a war with Russia in which the Finns did quite well back in the 1930s. Uh, and so they are very concerned that their democracy will be undermined by Russia. So they're responding not so much by hard counterattacks of information, but by training their population, by saying to individual Finns, it's your responsibility to take care of your, your intellectual sanctity, really, and not allow it to be disrupted by disinformation. You have to resist the devaluation of truth. It's an individual, not governmental responsibility. So that is a, a quick look at, at some of the issues that I cover in the book. There, there's a lot more, of course, in there. But I think it is safe to say, when I talk about modern warfare, that things such as what are going on, such as those going on in Ukraine right now, are a form of warfare. It is war, even without bullets and bombs, but it's still an existential threat to freedom. Uh, people who ignore it, whether they be individuals or governments, do so at their own peril. So that, I hope, will get us started for a good discussion here. Some questions. I look forward to hearing from all of you. Um, Patty, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Love that, you know, quick tour through the book. Um, and since you sort of ended with the discussion on media literacy, and I know that we had um, several uh, uh, pre-submitted questions about media literacy. Why don't we go back there? Um, one of the things that seems to be a, um, a concern uh, for people who have read the book is that while Finland, you know, has managed to do a wonderful job with this, and they actually have national policies on how this should work and in the integration, um, the the process that they have used um, is something that, you know, there's some concern the U.S. would not be able to manage because of um, the polarization and lots of other issues. What um, ha either have uh, you in, you know, thinking about this as you put it together, where do you think a good starting point might be on our conversation around media literacy? 
And do you have ideas for how we might be able to escape some of um, the, the pretty nasty stuff that's going on? Well, that latter part of your question, I, I wish I knew a way we could escape all the partisanship and how, how vehement it has become on all sides. And I think it goes back to a certain extent to the, to the fact that we have uh, this information just pours into us without gatekeepers. And we haven't done a good enough job in educating people, not just about information, but about civic responsibility over the past few decades and so demagogues can can take advantage of that i think it's going to be it would be difficult in in the united states i suggest that the, there there has to be a political component to this a, a bipartisan effort uh to develop some guidelines for for teaching media literacy bipartisan effort is kind of an outmoded <laughs> phrase these days i'm afraid uh, and uh, frankly, I am more hopeful about what other countries might be able to do than what the United States can do. But it, uh, it's extremely important. And uh, there have been studies done of the impact of information and disinformation on the 2016 US presidential election. Uh, there are lots of lessons that should caution us about just going merrily on our way and believing everything that we see and hear. Um, do I have a formula for that? No, but there are a good number of uh, nonprofit organizations and academic organizations that are trying to set up systems for, for fact-checking at places like Stanford and Duke, for example, they have fact-checking operations. Uh, there are any number of civic organizations that are in involved in media literacy training. The whole process just gets, needs to get a lot bigger, a lot faster within the United States. Thank you. Um, and one of the very first big time fact check organizations, factcheck.org, is run from the Annenberg Public Policy uh, Center at the University of Pennsylvania. And so uh, we're, we're big fans uh, in Annenberg. Uh, it's just a, a very, very important uh, issue right now. There's also one yeah. called FactCheck that's run out of Ukraine. So it, uh, if they, yeah. but they, they know how high the stakes are. Yeah, exactly. And so the stakes are very high. And I think a lot of the, um, the nonprofit uh, and NGOs that are working in this area are, are working really hard. I do sometimes wonder if the large number of fact-checking organizations um, that gets listed in a lot of publications takes into account um, the fact that sometimes our enemies start fact-check organizations so that people are unfortunately, you know, led to those organizations uh, even though they're not legitimate. So it's, right. a, it's a really huge challenge. We saw in the, the pre-submitted questions also a real clear concern for a couple of other things. The first one, um, uh, sort of in this next area that I wanted to ask you about is the infrastructure capabilities um, that we have or more often don't have in the U.S. around a lot of misinformation and disinformation. Um, one of the uh, um, submitters said, do we need to go back to um, a U.S. information agency? Um, and someone else wanted to know if, you know, we needed to um, have different legislation that would allow us to separate information from misinformation. And I know that when, um, when the questions first came in, I think one of the, the ones that I was most interested in 
was this idea that as we're looking at misinformation and disinformation, the tech companies, you know, are doing things like um, shut down Twitter accounts for people who put out misinformation. Are there other concepts like that that um, you think would be helpful as we build up more sort of structural reforms? Well, really two parts to, to that. Um, the whole issue of what about the U.S. Information Agency is extremely important in itself, and that, by the way, if you hear a loud noise outside, it's a snowplow <laughs> It's going down the road outside my apartment here. We had a couple inches of snow this morning here on the coast of Maine. Um, the um, the USIA was traded off in a political deal near the end of the Clinton administration. And I think it was a it was a big mistake. Certainly, the State Department has has carried on heroically, uh, but the idea of having having a separate information agency I think is even more important today uh, because information has become become so significant in in international relations related to conflict and in just non-conflict situations as well. In terms of the infrastructure, that is a really difficult question because what about free speech? I mean, I, I must confess I am not a great admirer of Donald Trump, but I do have a problem with kicking somebody off Twitter. Um, if you're going to allow person X on, you should probably allow person Y on as well. And, and if I want to get on Twitter and make up stuff, I can probably get away with doing it. That's that's one of the problems with it. Now, you know, I, I mentioned how much transformation had taken place in the 20th century and beginning right near the end of the 20th century when we start getting these these big social media players. Actually, it was the early part of the 21st century where you have Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube all emerge on the scene. And we were kind of overwhelmed by all that. We thought it was a good thing. Look at all this information we can get and look at how easily I can disseminate information on my own. You know, I told, I've told my students in one of my classes over the years, let's all take two hours. You all have laptops in front of you. Write some messages that denigrate a major religion and let's start a war. Uh, you could probably do that in two hours, and then I tell them, don't do that. <laughs> but it's, you know, that's that's the, it's both fascinating and frightening that, that that sort of thing could be done. And we've seen it done in the past. We've seen riots. We've seen people lose their lives because somebody uh, burned some Korans and got it up on YouTube. Some preacher down in one of the southern states, I can't remember which one, who had a congregation of about 12, and yet he was able to stir up an incredible amount of trouble, and he ended up, this this guy who was a little bit, or maybe more than a little bit nutty, the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff had to call him and say, stop doing that because you're endangering our troops in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so, I guess if you want to be uncharitable, but perhaps accurate, you, accurate, you could say that the the information tide is drowning us. And uh, I don't have an answer. If I had an answer, I'd tell you, <laughs> but I but I don't have one. And so that's uh, that's something we're going to have to deal with. It's like the whole question of media literacy. How are we going to have a programmatic response to the need to increase people's sophistication and skepticism about all this information they're getting. Yeah, I, I remember that case. That was fascinating. He was in Florida, but it was a tiny little church and it had an incredible amount of um, impact. One of the um, related questions you know, you brought up, you know, that you have trouble with people um, being kicked off Twitter. And one of the uh, participants uh, who sent us a question 
is really interested in the First Amendment issues and is, um, I think, uh, more concerned, you know, with another issue, the issue of are we um, balancing properly uh, security uh, versus uh, the, you know, the right to uh, be able to say whatever we want on Twitter or wherever it is that, that we're being able to talk uh, in uh, some place other than our bedrooms, right? And so that's it. That balancing act is, I think, at the heart of your your point. Yeah, and you know, there's that, of course, that famous Supreme Court decision that said freedom of speech does not mean that you have the right to shout fire in a crowded theater when there is no fire. So there are some limits to that have been established over many years as to how far you can go, but. And that shouting fire in a crowded theater when there is no fire, how close is that to to making scurrilous remarks about a particular religion uh, on Twitter or on Facebook or something like that? Is that constitutionally protected speech? That has yet to be determined. And I, I expect that within a few years, we're going to see an increasing number of, of legal challenges to this idea of is free does free speech protect is it all speech or is it all speech short of shouting fire or is it does it protect accurate speech and speech that is not hateful well what one person thinks is hateful another person might think is just fine so who is going to be the arbiter of all that um do we want to really turn that over to the court system as long as there is a an absence of civility in, in public discourse, um, there are going to be people who are very unhappy, there are going to be people who bring about court cases, and there will be just a, a general difficulty in trying to decide what all this speech means. And all the while this is going on, the amount of speech is going to increase more and more and more because of all these different technological venues uh, that we have available to us. So, um, and I, I can I can raise the issues, but I can't solve them. Uh, so that's uh, I'll leave that to the next generation. As my students know, they're all smarter than I am. So let them let them figure this out. I like that. Um, leave it to the next generation. I do sometimes feel like our generation broke the world, but that's a different <laughs> set of issues. So, one of the uh, one of the other really interesting um, questions uh, that we got from one of the participants uh, that I wanted to be sure to get to is if we are looking at um, this complicated area of misinformation, disinformation, um, just plain old sort of misunderstandings. Um, there's a philosophical issue around whether or not truth even really exists. And one of the participants wants to know, um, are are we dealing with a situation that is going to have to be constantly interrogated? Is this just the way of the world now where everything will be um, uh, that there's some kind of flaw? It's not real. Um, one of the other um, question askers even said, are we going to have um, fake news lead to a fake war or, or vice versa? We will have a fake war that's substantiated by fake news. And so, you know, there's a, there's a series of questions from people who are just trying to figure out what does truth really mean now? Well, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, the idea of, of fake news leading to fake war on a on a somewhat small scale, uh, there has been fake information that has led to riots and loss of life. 
um, and the step from you know a, a crowd of several thousand storming a U.S. embassy someplace and killing some people. Uh, a step from that to a larger war is, is not a very large step at all. Um, I think as as long as publics are easily manipulated, that danger will be will be very real. And it's interesting. I, I hate to talk about the Ukrainians as being sort of our our laboratory, but they are being pummeled by by information, especially the ethnic Russians in, in Ukraine. Uh, about how badly they're being treated and what a threat there is to them and so on and so forth. And we might well get a war out of that. And the other area that is very susceptible to, to getting this kind of pressure are, is the, the Baltic states, um, which of course used to be part of the Soviet Union. They border Russia and, uh, and Vladimir Putin, who has said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, uh, he's made it clear that he would like to rebuild that empire. So how does he do it without, now those Baltic states are all members of NATO, so it gets very tricky there. But I think, I think this idea of fake information contributing to a not so fake war is, uh, is a very real concern. And uh, I think governments, need to be conscious of that and need to have contingency plans. Um, and, and it has already come up uh, in a country like Estonia, for example, there's been all sorts of disinformation uh, directed at Estonia and the Estonian media and government have pushed back pretty hard on that. Um, but it's something that deserves much more attention. One of the suggestions related to this that I make in the book is that the traditional news media need to be doing more. Um, just as we have a sports beat and a beat covering the police and things like that, there should be an information beat. And in fact, I noticed recently that the uh, that the New York Times has designated one of its one of its journalists to be the information reporter, and. Um, you know, that, that's, I think, a step in the right direction. And one of the other things that Finland has going for it is that survey research there shows that the public has a lot of faith in Finnish public media. Uh, and so when the Finnish media are reporting, this is the, the mass media, are reporting about this, they have some credibility. And it's up to American news organizations to try to build or rebuild that kind of credibility with their audiences if they're going to get involved in this this uh, effort to control disinformation. I agree. I, I think that's a, it's a very, very well taken point. One of the um, uh, other issues that this leads us to um, is the relationship between the book and everything that's happening right now. You know, normally when you read a book, you, re you realize that the author has said a lot of things that's um, sort of foundational perhaps to what's going on, but th there's been this change or that change in the world. But instead, what happens when we read this book is there's this feeling of you had a really good sense of what was likely to happen. And you have specific sections on Ukraine. <laughs> You've got a specific on Russia, on China, everything that people are really concerned about at the moment. And so one of the um, one of the key issues then is if we look at what's going on in Ukraine not right now, what are your thoughts around um, this whole concept of what the U.S. may or may not be willing to do as part of uh, the challenge uh, that Ukraine finds itself in uh, with Russia amassing, you know, 100,000 soldiers uh, on the border. 
um, you have a really interesting um, little section in the book where we've got a lot of people saying, yeah, well, I don't think the U.S. is going to be really excited about actually doing anything um, with all these former Soviet states. So what's your thought? I'm just curious. Well, I, I think that's an important point because in terms of U.S. domestic politics, how many Americans want to see Americans dying for Ukraine? I would guess that 95 plus percent of Americans couldn't find Ukraine on a map. And, uh, and there's no treaty obligation even. Uh, now, when it gets down to NATO, even NATO countries, let's all go back to Estonia. Let's say the Russians put a move on Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania. Um, the United States is obligated by treaty to go to their defense. Um, are Americans going to be enthused about that? It's, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. The other night on, on one of the commercial networks on, on Netflix, there, there was a movie, a new movie called Munich, uh, based on Robert Harris's novel. And when they talk about in that movie about the Nazis moving into Czechoslovakia, the parallels between that and what the Russians might be doing with Ukraine are just so striking. And of course, the world, the West did not, Western Europe and the United States did not stop the Germans and look what happened. The question now is, if you don't stop the Russians, what will happen in the future? And if you stop them, how do you stop them without going to war? Of course, the big change, the big difference between that, that those incidents back in the, in the late 1930s and today is nuclear weapons. And uh, we can never forget that, that Russia has those along with other countries. So it's, uh, it's confounding, certainly. And you need good leadership to, to, get, to get the public to, to recognize that there there have to be standards of behavior, and uh, I think that the answer probably would be if the Russians go into Ukraine, I don't think there'll be a military response by the U.S., but I think there will be crippling economic response, and I think Putin is probably aware of that. Kicking Russia off SWIFT, for example, the big back banking information exchange, uh, that would that would pretty much wreck the Russian economy. Uh, stopping the pipeline, the natural gas pipeline. There are lots of things that can be done short of a uh, kinetic warfare. And so we'll we'll see what what happens. It's not good by any means. And certainly the the people in Ukraine. There are already fourteen thousand people dead in Ukraine uh, from fighting since two thousand fourteen when the Russians first moved in. And uh, so that. It's a tough world out there, and information is just part of it. And um, I think, as with so many other issues, good leadership is extremely, extremely important. Leadership, which would include getting people to think more about about the information that they're getting or not getting. Uh, okay, I think I spoke too soon. I didn't wait for my little green light to come on. Okay, so um, I, I think we can do one last uh, question. And this one is not simple, but I think you can probably give us, you know, some insights. One of the things that you talk about in the book that I was particularly intrigued with is the the uh, which um, other countries do very detailed segmentation studies on the U.S. Uh, Russia in particular, but you can see this happening um, with others as well. And they're trying to figure out what messages work with you know which people for what reasons. Um, as we think about um, that sort of process, um, should we be doing more of that for 
um, other parts of the world. Uh, the U.S. does some stakeholder analysis. It does some media analysis, but not to the degree that the Russians do. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I think in, that, that's that's one of the issues that I probably should have devoted more time to in the book is counterpunching. Uh, is that the United States has to be prepared to engage in not so much necessarily information warfare, but in providing information to make the case for the U.S. It goes back to what we were talking about with the with the absence of USIA. And if you go back to the uh, to the days when back during the Kennedy administration, when Ed Burrow was in charge of information, he was very aggressive and and uh, and the US information effort was very aggressive in reaching other countries. I think perhaps after we supposedly won the Cold War, the United States became too relaxed and and hasn't fully gotten back up to speed in terms of dealing with the fact that we have very serious adversaries out there and that information is a tool that can work either against us or can work to our benefit. And so that is uh, that's something that we need to take up and 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 push harder on, I think. You can't always rely on a one-shot electronic attack as happened in 2018 going after the Internet Research Agency. Uh, that was that was effective and it was a demonstration that the US was going to draw some limits on manipulating our trying to manipulate our political system but there there needs to be a more systemic ongoing response in dealing with information and there's stacy ready to tell us to go away no never never phil except for go away in and enjoy your retirement um <laughs> um I have had such a great time listening to phil uh Happy to patty Yes, please. Yes, please, my dear. You have to pay tribute to my editorial assistant. I give him a plug in the book, but he made it possible, right? Happy health, happy New Year, Mac. Um, <laughs> thank you, Phil. I, I, you always have had the most extraordinary uh, support for your research and your books, um, uh, not, notwithstanding Mac and some of your amazing students. I do know that. Um, it has been an honor and a pleasure to listen to you, Phil and, and Patty, um, talk about the, this very complicated uh, subject matter, which I look forward to the next generation solving, um, hopefully in my lifetime. I wish you all an absolutely fabulous 2022, and I'll see you all online again for some future CPD programming. We've had... Here is yes. the book. <laughs> um, we've had board members in here, you've had previous students, you've had scholars, uh, global uh, colleagues, and so it's been a really love fest this, this morning, uh, Los Angeles time. Again, thank you for your time, thank you for your scholarship. Patty, thank you for an amazing moderating duties, and I wish you all the very best, and have a great day or evening, wherever you are. Take care, hey, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Thank you.